Welcome to our discussion on market efficiency, behavioral finance, and the psychology of investing. Um, in this lecture, we're going to break this down into two different lectures. We're going to talk about market efficiency, basically the first 10 pages of the notes in this lecture. So what do we mean by market efficiency? Now, the notes are going to have a good bit more of a textual description. I'm not going to read to you the text, but give sort of an overview of the different topics. So for the most part, market efficiency relates to market prices reflect um, publicly available information quickly and accurately. And the efficient market hypothesis basically says you can't really beat the market. Prices are as accurate as possible and you shouldn't expect to earn an abnormal return. But what exactly is an abnormal return? There's different ways of measuring it. One way would be just to say the company return minus the market return. So if that is positive, you've earned an abnormal positive return. If it's You don't want an abnormal negative return, but if your return's five and the market's 10, even though five is bigger than zero, it's 5% less than the market return. That would be an abnormal negative return. Similarly, you could think of, well, if the market's down 20 and you're only down 10, that's actually a positive abnormal return. So even if you have a negative return, it can be abnormally positive. <clears throat> One of the problems with measuring abnormal return is usually there needs to be some type of adjustment for company specific risk. And so a more specific measure that you're vaguely familiar with that Jensen's alpha from the correlation matrix attempts to measure the required rate of return using the capital asset pricing model. So you take your company return and subtract out the return you should expect to earn based on the capital asset pricing model. The problem with that is that's based on an estimate of beta, your market risk. And as we now know, it's hard to get a good estimate of beta, where the R squared's high and we have confidence that our beta's esti estimate is accurate, and hence our required rate of return is accurate. Um, for purposes of this content, we'll just usually define a normal return as the difference between company return and market return. <clears throat> All right. Um, the foundations of market efficiency assume investors are rational. So you can say that's a big assumption. Um, if independent deviations from rationality, that is if someone makes a really stupid decision, that's independent. Not everyone's gonna make the exact same stupid decision. Um, and then to the extent that prices are inaccurate, arbitrage opportunities will drive the prices back to efficiency. So for example, if the price of Toyota adjusted for exchange rates is 100 in the US and it's 80 in Japan, um, arbitragers would buy in Japan and sell in the U.S. and drive those prices back to an equilibrium. Okay, different types of market efficiency. There's a weak form, semi-strong form, and strong form. The strong form is all encompassing. That includes all information, both public and private. Semi-strong form includes only publicly available information. And then weak form includes just historical information. So you, <clears throat> one way of looking at this is to say, technical analysts typically think the market's not efficient at all, that you can use historical price information to generate future returns. <clears throat> um, most academics don't believe the market's weak form efficient, or they do believe it is weak form efficient, I should say. They th think that um, technical analysis does not work. However, there's difference, more difference of opinion as to whether the market is semi-strong form. Can you make an abnormal profit based on publicly available information? If you can, that means the market is not semi-strong form efficient. Um, if you cannot, if once a company announces higher than expected earnings, the price reacts quickly and efficiently to that new information, there's no way of looking at that information and saying, oh, that company's undervalued, I should buy it now. And then finally, strong form includes even private information. And most people would recognize that if I'm the only person who knows that Walmart's getting ready to announce lower than expected earnings. I should be able to profit from that information. Um, it is technically illegal for people to profit from insider information. And we'll talk about that here shortly. All right, here's some textual description. Here's some textual description as to why markets would be efficient. For the most part, there's a strong incentive to find those mispricings. And if you own a lot of assets like the Fidelity Magellan Fund, you can spend a ton of money trying to look for those mispricings, hire a lot of analysts to search for undervalued assets. And even if you only have a slight improvement, a slight abnormal return, as a percentage of a large investment, that is very profitable. So read through the text. I'm just glancing over it for the purposes of the lecture. Um, 
let's see, this is basically a textual description of what I was trying to say earlier that for the most part, if the market's weak form efficient, you can't make profits from past information and so forth. All right, let's see. Random walk, here's a new idea. <clears throat> a random walk basically assumes prices are unpredictable in the short term. And I'm gonna give you an example with a spreadsheet to talk about or to see what a random walk might look like. So if we were to go to our sheet and look at this random walk stock price, this is a random walk. Now you could say, oh, this is obviously the elongated W and what's gonna happen in the future is here's the downward slope, we're getting ready for a small peak and then a small downturn, then a large peak again. So the repeating elongated W's are obviously gonna happen again. But if we were to change that chart this slightly, let me see if I can do that. Um, oh, this is a different chart. This is the downward creeping triple peak. So there's a peak, peak, peak. Now we're down again. Now we're looking for a new peak, second peak, and then a third peak in the future. This is the type of analysis technical analysts do. They look at historical charts and identify patterns. What I would suggest to you is we haven't really seen a pattern. I've just made up these things as we've gone, and I can change the chart each time. And each time I change the chart, I get the WM pattern. So there's a W, here's an M, here's a W, I'm looking for an M. These, this chart's being generated by a random number. So these formulas over here are just a random number. The random function in Excel generates a number between zero and one. So I'm saying if it's less than 0.5, add one. If it's otherwise, subtract one. So these plus or minus ones are just being randomly generated throughout the sheet and then being plotted over here to the right. And so every time you change the sheet, I'm just pressing space and enter you generate a new chart. And these are all randomly generated. There is no pattern to be seen, although you may visually think, oh, I see a pattern. It is not there. Those are random patterns. Those numbers, those changes in the price are being generated randomly. So that's what a random walk is. A random walk can appear to be have a pattern, but if, it's, if you know the underlying distribution, if I know this is a 50-50 coin flip distribution, this is a reasonable expectation. All right, let's get back to the notes. All right, so that's what random walk and stock prices, how that's related to one another. All right, how does information get into the prices? That's related to market efficiency. And we're gonna assume an efficient market, it gets in there quickly. So the efficient market reaction would be quick. A delayed reaction would involve a company announces higher than expected earnings. It takes a while for the stock price to reflect that information. And then finally, the stock price might actually go up too high and then adjust back downward. So graph visually, here are some adjustments. So suppose here's time elapsing, here's the event, here's the earnings announcement at time zero. The efficient market reaction is the solid blue. The price should go up immediately and reflect that new positive information. That's so, that's a positive earnings announcements. Um, a delayed reaction will look something like this yellow dotted line. Here's the announcement and then people over the course of the next week decide, oh, that's a good, a good company, they're doing well, I'm gonna buy it. And the, eventually the price would react. An overreaction would be the price jumps up and then keeps on going up and then people finally realize, hey, wait a minute, the only this isn't that great of an announcement and it re uh, falls back down to the true value. So the intrinsic value, the true value is basically the solid blue line and that's the efficient market reaction. In practice, you kind of observe all of these for any individual company. In aggregate, I would suggest for the most part, stock prices reflect that information quickly uh, we'll just look at a couple examples here. The first thing I want to look at is sort of just measuring this, both this initial reaction, this abnormal return, and the cumulative abnormal return. So if we were to go back to this sheet and look at this CAR, CAR is an acronym for cumulative abnormal return. Let's just suppose here's an announcement at time zero. Here's the market return in column B, the company return in column C, and then the abnormal return in column D. So there's basically no abnormal return going on for the five days prior to the announcement. On the day of the announcement, say it's a good announcement, and there's a abnormal return of 1.9%. The market was down, and this company was up 1.8, so there's an abnormal return. In the days following the announcement, there's basically up and down, no real noticeable abnormal return. The cumulative abnormal return just adds together all the previous abnormal return. So Initially, it's negative one. With the positive one, it's back to zero. Negative one, back to zero. So this 
cumulative abnormal return is just taking the prior value and adding the next day's abnormal return. So at time zero, we have a cumulative abnormal return of 1.7, which is basically the abnormal return on the day of the announcement. And then there's really no further adjustment. This is a perfect straight line, but it's pretty close. This is more akin to what you would actually observe in a market. You wouldn't get the completely flat line, completely straight up, and completely flat again. But this is sort of how you would measure both the abnormal return without adjusting for risk and then a cumulative abnormal return. <clears throat> in some instances, if you start seeing this thing creeping up, like it's 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 1.2, 1.7, that tends to indicate, well, the information leaked. This abnormal return starting before the announcement. So sometimes this is what academics do to see, like, is there insider trading going on? Is something going on prior to the announcement? And then you can also measure sort of the over or under reaction um, relative to where it needs to be. Like if there's no further new announcement, you basically should get the market return henceforth. And so whatever the initial abnormal return is, you should basically get cumulatively over time. All right, so those are the two tabs in the market efficiency and behavioral finance sheet. We're basically done with that for now. <clears throat> I also want to look at this QLYS um, earnings announcement. So if we were to click on that link, it should take us here. And what this looks like if we were to scroll down, here is a company that has reported or have earnings estimates in dark blue and the reported earnings in light blue. And they've consistently throughout 2019 reported higher than expected earnings. That's pretty good news. Um, down here we can measure sort of that what's called an earnings surprise or, or abnormal return. Um, here's the date they reported the earnings per share estimate was or estimate but the earnings per share was 45 cents per share. The consensus forecast was 41 cents so that's a four cent surprise. On a basis of 41, that's like almost a 10% surprise. Even though it's only four cents, that's four cents out of 40 is 10%. And they've been doing this pretty consistently throughout 2019. You see their earnings are always, for that year, higher than expected. And so you see this earning surprise. That's an abnormal return if, you, if they report higher than expected earnings. So we should expect to see the stock price jump up. So in this case, the most recent one of these, well, let's not look, 2020 is kind of jacked up. Let's look at this most recent one, the second most recent one, this October 30th, 2019. So if we were to go to the stock chart, and here I've got going from like October 1st through November 30th, I got the stock chart. And you can kind of see this, these bars in the bottom are the trading volume. Now this is, they announced it on the 30th. So here's their day of the announcement. And you can see a couple things. You see a higher than larger trading volume, both the day prior, the day of, and the day after uh, this earnings announcement. And we do see, if we were to take sort of the day of the announcement, it's like 83 to the day after, it's 85, it went up $2 a share. Um, to the extent that the earnings announcement was higher than expected, we would expect to see the stock price jump up to that new level. And basically, I would suggest using this chart is it basically stayed at that new level all the way through the end of the month. I'm having trouble getting that last value there. But in any case, well, you could say, well, there's an extra little bump. Maybe there's a, it took an extra day to get the full reaction to that closer to 87 value. But here's where I would suggest it's abnormal. If you look at the purple line up here, the market actually went down over that interval. The market went down, whereas they announced higher than expected earnings, their price went up. So that is an abnormal return, but it, I would say it's an efficient return. Why did they go up when the market went down? Well, QLYS went up because they announced higher than expected earnings. All right, so in any case, that is a, a larger window, in effect, version of this earnings announcement. Okay, here's a little bit of a discussion on insider trading and informed trading. For the most part, insider trading is illegal. So if you work for a company or whatever reason, you come across material non-public information, you're not allowed to trade on that. What's the material? Well, that means it would affect the price. If it's non-public, that no one else knows it. Um, so that's illegal. Informed trading is just gathering up public information and coming up with a thesis and trading on that. That's perfectly legal to do informed trading. Insider trading, that's when you know something not everyone knows. That's illegal in the United States. Um, it is legal. What's a little bit confusing, I suppose, um, is for 
corporate executives to buy and sell shares of their own stock. That's considered to be legal trading. They're insiders. They run the company, but they just have, there's a good bit deal, bit more of paperwork. They got to file out, well, why are you trading? Is it based on public information? They have to report it to the SEC. So, I mean, they can buy and sell shares and that's reported, but it's ideally different. They're not trading on information. Oh, tomorrow we're announcing higher than expected or lower than expected earnings. And so now I'm going to sell out of my shares or buy more shares. But in any case, so there's a slight difference there. It is possible for executives to trade shares. However, they're not supposed to do that on material, non-public information. Okay, so that's insider trading. Whoops. All right, how are markets efficient? Well, for the most part, <clears throat> short-term pricing movements are very difficult to predict. Sort of a random walk in the short term. Uh, markets tend to react quickly and if the stock market can be beaten, it's not obvious how that can be done. For the most part, most academics studying markets have come to the conclusion that stock prices reflect all publicly available information. All right, what about bubbles and crashes and anomalies? All right, for example, it was documented that Monday produced a negative return. That seems weird because if you think about it, if there's five trading days in a week, and the overall trend in the market's up, you should expect to see the average return on Mondays up, Tuesday up, Wednesday up, Thursday up, Friday up. They should all be a positive if the overall trend is positive. Um, you could even make the argument that Monday should be especially high because it would incorporate both Saturday and Sunday non-trading days into its return. So if anything, Monday should have a higher than average return relative to the other days of the week. The anomaly is it's negative. The other days of the week are all have an average positive return, but Monday has an average negative return. So that's sort of the Monday effect. That's an anomaly. That shouldn't happen in efficient market. So based on that, you could buy stocks late on Monday and sell on Friday and make an abnormal return. What has happened once this anomaly became publicly known, it disappeared. Um, so markets are efficient to the extent that once it was publicly known, however, some people uncovered that and traded on it for a while. So that's what a lot of academic financial economists do is if they do happen to find an anomaly, they don't necessarily publish that result until after they've formed their own company and traded on that information. But in any case, <clears throat> there are anomalies, documented anomalies. Another documented anomaly is the January effect. Um, that is, historically speaking, small company stocks have an abnormal return in January. Now, again, once that became publicly known, that effect has kind of dissipated over time. So there are documented anomalies that should not happen in efficient markets. Another, there's a couple others there you can read on your own. I'm not gonna read all of that, but bubbles and crashes, what's going on with that? Like what about the 1929 stock market crash? What about the Asian crash? Um, sometimes it seems like that was just bad um, investing in the case of the investors. When you look at some of the prospectus, um, like in the 1720s, we got a company for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is. Why would you buy a share of stock in that company? You don't even know what they do. In the 1960s, a prospectus warned, hey, we don't have any assets or earnings and we're not gonna be able to pay dividends and the shares are risky. I mean, that just sounds like a bad idea. And in addition to that, some of the things that cause bubbles and crashes are the amplifiers, which we should be somewhat familiar with using calls, sort of amplifying the return, or for positive or negative, or buying on the margin, borrowing money to buy shares, um, sort of creates excess demand, drives prices to too high levels. A couple of historical examples I do want to point out. Uh, the stock market crash in 1929 using GE as an example. Went from like 128 to 396, 200% return in 18 months, that was awesome. However, the stock market crash occurred and it fall all the way down to $8. That's like a 98% loss. And that's kind of what I'm hoping does not happen as a result of this coronavirus. Um, but you could think if you held on, eventually the stock market did recover. In the United States, the stock market has always recovered from bubbles and crashes. That's not necessarily true internationally. If you look at the Asian crash, the Nikkei, let's take a quick look at that. If we were to look at this Nikkei 225, back in what is that? October of 1989, the Nikkei index was like 38,915. Today, it's like 17,000. It still hasn't recovered. That was 30 years ago. 
So that is an example of a crash where the market has not recovered even in the long term. So you can find international examples of bubbles or crashes where the market has not recovered. In the United States, the law of gravitational pull tends to ultimately pull stocks up, but not necessarily in the case of Asian companies. Um, this is still, I guess, prior to your time, but the dot com, we, we can look at some of the companies that still exist today from the internet. When that first came out, all kinds of companies were jumping up like crazy, but then there was a crash. I want to look at two companies in particular related to the dot-com crash. I want to look at Cisco, which exists today. So if we were to look at Cisco and say, well, here they were in 1990. They went up to a peak. Can I get this peak? They were trading for like $77 a share. And then a couple years later, they're all the way down to like $10 a share. So they went from like 77 to 10. And they've not recovered. They're up to 33 today, but they've not recovered to their pre-internet bubble peak. They still exist. They didn't go out of business. A lot of companies went out of business when the internet bubble burst. Internet stocks just jumped out of nowhere, new invention, all kinds of people buying everything, driving prices way up. They crashed and recovered. So that's an example of a lot of companies disappeared. Here's a company that didn't disappear but has not recovered to their peak. However, I also want to point out Amazon. You look at Amazon today. Let's look at Amazon and Let's see if I can get this. Here is, let's get to 2000-ish. Here's January of 2000, Amazon was $64. A couple years later, they crashed down to like $8. So there was a bubble here. It went from like 64, 75, like Amazon was at a peak of like 85 down to six. That's a big crash. However, you look at Amazon today, they're at 17, 1,785. That bubble bursting here is almost unnoticeable. You have to actually look at the actual prices. And this isn't a logarithmic scale. So that sort of distorts this crash. So Amazon not only survived the crash, but has provided tremendous growth since. Cisco survived the tremendous crash, but still hasn't recovered completely. So in any case, bubbles and crashes occur both for individual stocks and then also economy-wide or sector-wide in the case of technology stocks, you could say. All right, uh, one that you probably have lived through is the actual crash of 2008. That was related to real estate collapse. Um, real estate prices basically went way above the historical average, and then they collapsed, resulting in the stock market collapse, which the stock market has recovered since then. There is a good movie I would recommend to you based on that crash uh, titled The Big Short, written by Michael Lewis. Um, so I would definitely recommend watching that movie to get some of the inside scoop as to what caused the uh, stock market crash of 2008. Um, so we've got, those are historical crashes and bubbles. Um, so the question I've got for you is, even when a new industry comes about, the prices do get overly inflated. How do you know to buy Amazon and not buy pets.com? I mean, that's where sort of, if you buy the index, you eventually get sort of an average of the return. The industry is going to do well over the long term, but it's hard to know which one is the best one, in my opinion. If markets are efficient, you can't really tell that Amazon's the winner. The online book buying is going to turn into online everything buying, and they're, the, they're going to be the winner. Whereas Cisco survived, but you didn't necessarily win if you bought at its peak. At least not yet. All right, I did want to point out one last thing before we talk about behavioral finance in the next lecture. The one last thing I wanted to point out is sort of, here's today's world. Um, you could say, here's the Russell 2000 since 2000. And you can say, take a perspective of 2000. Well, the Russell 2000 is basically doubled from like 500 to 1000. So that's pretty good. 20 years, it's doubled. Um, however, if you take a more of a one month perspective, it started the year at 1600 and now it's down like 50% almost. So that's not so good. So we are in the midst of, or at least as of 317, 2020, we're in the midst of a crash. This is a crash, no doubt about it. Um, I am hoping for the long-term US market recovery where eventually the stock market recovers. However, why, what causes that crash? I would just suggest to you, it, it relates to stock valuation. If you think of the constant growth model, we got dividends and the numerator, 
required rate of return minus the growth rate in the denominator. All three of those, um, a change in any of those three creates a significant change in the stock price, the intrinsic value. And you could say, well, what does D1 represent? It basically represents current profits. Current profits are down, so that should reduce prices. What about the required rate of return? Well, that's reflective of risk. Risk is higher, the required rate of return is higher. And as that gets higher, that reduces stock prices. So you got current profits going down, reduces stock prices, risk going up, reduces stock prices, and finally growth. It's hard to know, but most people would assume there's growth is going to decrease significantly. And as growth gets smaller, the denominator gets larger and the price gets lower. So all three factors in the intrinsic value valuation are heading in the wrong direction, causing dramatic change in the value of stocks. Hopefully that recovers, but that concludes our discussion on market efficiency. Uh, we're gonna wrap up here. We'll finish our discussion on behavioral finance um, in a separate lecture. So good luck with your study of market efficiency. As you come across questions, post them to Canvas and I will get those answered for you.